So a couple things before we get started. Um, I'm sure all of you are following my lab on Facebook, right? Um, there's a, actually a really nice blog post by Vincent Racaniello about um, some of the theories that people have about Zika virus and why it's actually causing so many problems in South and Central America right now. And a lot of that probably has to do with very similar things to antibody-mediated dengue virus stimulation. Um, because it turns out antibodies to dengue do seem to be interacting with Zika. So um, that may be why um, this is particularly problematic um, right now. So it's a nice blog post. And yeah, just you know, like my lab on Facebook, and you'll get all these <laughs> wonderful posts. So I'm still trying to catch up with the uh, biology department page. So I need a bunch more likes before we get there. Um, so <clears throat> Today, um, we're going to talk about coronaviruses, but as I promised, um, first we'll have some clicker questions about flaviviruses, which we'll start out now, if we can get this thing to move. There we go. Um, which was the first flavivirus to be discovered? Hepatitis C, dengue, West Nile virus, yellow fever, or Zika? But if you get it wrong, it's all Alex's fault, not mine. <laughs> this is a whole bunch of that so, far, so far, so good. Let's see what the statistics look like. <laughs> Quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> I guess everyone's come to a consensus. So, anyone else want to vote? No? Good, let's stop now because we have, lo and behold, wait for it. Yay! <laughs> And no, I guess whoever it was, it's like ruining my statistics isn't here today. <laughs> or their batteries are dead on their clicker, as the case may be. So, yes, yellow fever um, by far and away. In fact, it was discovered very soon after the whole discovery of viruses to, in fact, be viral. So, um, and that wonderful quote that Alec had that I can't remember now in terms of, what was it, you know, black uh, vomit and all that good stuff. So... <clears throat> Our second question, and we will now hide the answers here quickly before you vote again, and I get to start. Um, which of the following is currently causing the highest mortality in the world? Hepatitis C, dengue, West Nile, yellow fever, or Zika? So nice to be able to use the same answers for two seconds. <laughs> you may or may not have, however, the same correct answer. People. Human mortality. Who the hell is surveying in the DRC? Who? Come on. It's really amazing how good those data are. They're, no, it, they'll, be, they'll be small numbers, and there's definitely statistical issues with that. But, I know there's polio and pneumonia. They're burning witches for it. Acute class of paralysis, yes. Polio, we don't know. And is that, because that's one of the issues with your acute, acute class of paralysis. There are, are other things that are causing it. I, I've got a primary source that's researching economics. Mm -hmm. there. Yeah, no, reporting is clearly an issue. There's no question about it. And that's, <laughs> and there are places in the world that there's really crummy reporting. <laughs> Oh. It's the wrong one. Can't have that. <laughs> um, yes, dengue is correct. 
Um, and yes, it's mortality. Now, if we ask about mortality of birds, West Nile West West by far. Um, mortality of journalists? No. Um, so yes, um, dengue by far and away. Yes. But in my notes, I think this slide had um, something like 400 million infections a year, 500,000 severe, and 2.5 percent lethal. Mm -hmm. I think Chris is there by how I type. Is that 2.5 percent of the 500,000 that sounds lethal? Severe. Of the severe. Yeah, which would only be about 12,000 a year. Does that sound no, like it's it's considerably or? higher than it's that. Higher. Yeah. At least that's my understanding. I will check and make sure. That's always good to correct me on these things because it was far too late at night when I came up with these um, things in the first place. So, uh, <clears throat> next one, flaviviruses replicate, finally getting to something, you know, molecular biology here. Uh, at the plasma membrane and endosomes, at membranes in the cytoplasm, the nuclear membrane in the nucleus. see if it ends up something other than 48. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody come in early. <laughs> That's true. Oh, one more. Okay. <laughs> But there are others. Yeah. At least, you know, at least uh, things light up. That's true. So. Ten. Okay. <laughs> the. Um, <clears throat> Majority here are for, where are we? Eh, pointer will show up eventually. Um, for membranes in the cytoplasm, um, and that is in fact correct. Um, why isn't it endosomes? Endosomes are really where you're getting the reduction in pH, and then it would be escape from these endosomes. And all of this is actually happening in the cytoplasm, not on the inside of any of these um, particular particles. We'll see it's a little bit different for the coronaviruses um, in just a second. So where are we here? Select answer. Ooh. So, and then the last starting clicker question is now way back to poliovirus. What the heck was poliovirus? Yeah, flip back in your notes a little bit. Um, what is the <clears throat> primer for poliovirus genome synthesis? Cellular cap, a viral cap, a cellular RNA, a viral RNA, or VPG? <laughs> Make sure you get flicked. <laughs> 48, okay. Did we lose one? 49, I think we're in an okay shape. 50, uh-oh. Somebody just brought two clickers. 
51. Man, okay, where did all this stuff come from? Okay, so <clears throat> what is the primer for poliovirus genome synthesis? Um, yes, it is the VPG protein, and I know this is kind of a dead time between, okay, we just finished with the last midterm, we're studying for all the current midterms, and we haven't started studying for the next midterm in this class yet. Uh, but this is uh, very important that we have a protein primer for replication, and this is always going to be an issue in terms of making RNA genomes, because how you make those RNA genomes, and this is going to be true for yeah, all the RNA genomes, and also for the DNA genomes, where do those primers actually come from? Yeah? When you talk about a thyrosine Okay, maybe I'm, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but I, I can just go over, go over again basically how I see this happening. And so what happens is you've got an OH on your tyrosine, um, and that OH is where the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is what in polio? The three... <laughs> so it's the <clears throat> 3D protein is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So that will take that OH on the tyrosine and start to extend from there. And so that's your primer. And then once it's added the two U's, then it moves in other parts of the genome. That ends up base pairing with the poly-A tail to start with. And then when you're actually replicating the full genome, that will have copied to an opposite of two A's. And then it will anneal to those two A's and serve as a primer for the other part of the genome. So that's when I say primer, I mean that's where you're actually starting the replication by the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the case of these RNA viruses or a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase if you're a DNA virus or RNA-dependent DNA polymerase if you're a retrovirus. So, but the primers, uh, this is you know, all of these DNA polymerase-like replicases, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, RNA they all need primers. They can't start by themselves. So that's one of the big differences that these guys have or anything else. Does that make more sense? Okay, sorry, that I didn't completely understand the <laughs> your question there. So, um, yes, and the answer is, ah, okay, show them again. Actually select them. This little green thing. Good. So, uh, already talked about <coughs> the VPG and the 3D polymerase. So that's part of the review here. Um, irises are what? Internal ribosome entry sites, exactly. Um, proteases, why do you need proteases for? To break up the polyprotein and also at the very end when you're doing assembly to break up those very last little pieces in terms of your capsid protein. Um, those are your protomers. Um, yeah, the host is unhappy. This is the same slide I used last time. Uh, why is the host so unhappy? Translation, Translation machinery gets completely shut down. Why? Uh, yeah. Proteases cleave the initiation factors for translation. Okay, so nice review, things to think about um, next time around. So <clears throat> now let's get even bigger. In fact, these are the largest RNA virus genomes known. Um, these are the coronaviruses. Still positive strand, so that means that the RNA gets translated directly into protein. Uh, originally, people thought of these as being, you know, common cold, wasn't such a big deal, and then, well, let's see, a couple of strange viruses came along. Uh, literally, in the last five years, probably are the first examples of some of these, at least in humans, um, SARS and MERS. So people have gotten much more excited and interested in these viruses since then, and again, literally just in the last couple of years. A um, couple of important things about these viruses that we haven't talked about before. One of those is that most of the receptors, i.e. the proteins or the macromolecules, I should say, on the surface of the host cells, these are mostly proteases, which is a really interesting kind of thing to use as a receptor, except you start to think about the fact that most of these virions need to be metastable. So if a virion needs to be metastable, it's stable nicely on the outside of the cell, but when you reach the cell, it needs to become unstable to release its genome. Protease actually is a potentially really good way to get that to be unstable once it actually reaches the cell. 
Frame shifting, we've talked about a little bit already. Um, turns out that this is absolutely critical for making the different proteins. And so this is just getting the ribosome to move back and forth um, and give you different proteins. The major thing here, as far as the coronaviruses are concerned, is subgenomic RNAs. Um, so even though the whole genome is just one single piece of positive strand RNA, making particularly the proteins that you need lots of, which would be all of the capsid proteins, all your virion proteins, um, those are all made from smaller RNAs. And so how do you go from one big long RNA to a whole bunch of smaller RNAs? And that's a very interesting prospect here. And in fact, these coronaviruses are part of a big group called the nidoviruses, which are called nested subgenomic RNAs. And we'll get back to that a bit later on. The other thing I wanted to mention was something that we also haven't talked about too much yet, is the whole concept of a reservoir species. And these are where most of these viruses are most of the time. And there's the what they call the spillover effect, which is where you have the viruses that are normally circulating in a host that usually doesn't seem to get really sick. Those then get moved over into humans, and we get really sick. Um, and from the virus point of view, again, sort of shifting and thinking about these things, uh, it makes much more sense to not make your host sick because if you're dependent on a host to replicate, making a host really sick and having it die is not a very good evolutionary process. Um, so <clears throat> most viruses are in fact um, under these kinds of conditions. So here's a nice electron micrograph of these coronaviruses and what you're supposed to see here, and again, this is why they got called coronaviruses in the first place, are these crowns of spikes around the outside. So if you look at one of these viruses in the electron microscope, and in fact, I was talking to Dr. Hirsch yesterday after lecture, he said, oh, can you do some electron microscopy for us? So with any left, we'll get to do some of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the reasons to invest, get, invite guest lecturers so you can try and get collaborations going after that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about origins, and as often is true here, origins has to do with disease. Um, then the interesting stuff, of course, the molecular aspects of things, um, structure, binding and entry, and then, of course, he puts stuff in red that he thinks is particularly important. Um, and this is that whole idea of the nested subgenomic RNAs. Um, translation, turns out, is pretty straightforward, um, as is assembly and release. So <clears throat> coronaviruses, a whole bunch of different coronaviruses. We knew a whole bunch about different coronaviruses, uh, most of them, again, causing things like colds, bronchitis, um, and then make pigs sick and you know, making some dogs sick and cats sick and some bat coronaviruses. But more importantly here is all these bat coronaviruses um, seem to be pretty asymptomatic. So that's one thing. And then, of course, um, we have our friend down here, um, SARS coronavirus, um, which uh, people got really excited about, not surprisingly. Where are we here? Um, and ended up all over the place. Come on. Yes, uh, truth about SARS, SARS, what you need to know, epidemics, blah, 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 blah. Um, we'll see how really problematic SARS was as far as um, particularly um, here in, in the U.S. So most disease, um, actually most of these are animal viruses. <clears throat> Some of the quote-unquote common cold. What's the most common cold virus? Rhinoviruses, which are what kind of virus? RNA viruses, exactly. Um, a lot of the work before SARS came along uh, was done with murine hepatitis virus, um, and the main reason to mention this here is, A, it's a great model system because it gives mice hepatitis, uh, but it doesn't make us sick, and so it's really easy to work with in the lab. Um, <clears throat> and also, it's yet another different kind of hepatitis virus. So we had hepatitis A virus, which is what kind of virus? Oh, man, that would have been one of the really you know, nasty clicker questions to ask. Also a picoRNA virus. Um, hepatitis C virus is a uh, flavivirus from last time, and hepatitis B is a totally different bizarre one as well. And there's also hepatitis D, which is yet another different kind of virus, and here we have a coronavirus, which is causing hepatitis. So uh, basically hepatitis can be caused by all kinds of different viruses, which is why naming things based on the disease is a really bad way to name viruses, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, <clears throat> be it as it may, nobody really cared about coronaviruses. They were pretty, they were nice, they had these big, humongous genomes, but nobody really cared until SARS came along. 
Um, and this is really amazing in terms of the progression, in terms of how fast some of these viruses both arose in terms of disease, were diagnosed in terms of what caused them, and then completely disappeared. No, no one talks about SARS anymore. Um, so the disease was first reported in February 2003. There were 1,300 reported cases by March, so a month later, which is really pretty amazing. Um, and then a couple of months later, they actually discovered the coronavirus. And they were very confused. People actually thought these were influenza-like viruses for a very long period of time. So a lot of the symptoms were very similar to what was happening in terms of influenza viruses, but they couldn't find influenza viruses associated um, with these people. So what does SARS stand for? Severe acute respiratory syndrome. Um, basically, you can't get enough oxygen. That's the main problem um, with SARS. Um, 774 deaths of about a little over 8,000 cases. And how many in the US? So we're really scared about this and put it all over the covers of things. Eight cases, zero deaths in the USA. So um, how do you get SARS? And actually, for that matter, pretty much any of these coronavirus infections, um, very direct contacts on aerosols. So you know, the person sitting next to you is just about you know, as close. But a lot of the people, and really unfortunately for this, and it's when we talk about the phyloviruses and Ebola, it's very close contact and often is caregivers. So and we'll see right at the end of the lecture today that um, a lot of the places where people actually end up coming down with these coronavirus diseases are in healthcare settings. Um, so it's that very close, um, close connection there. But of course, the question is, where did it come from? And for a long time, it was thought to be these civet cats. Um, SARS arose where? In China, and particularly in some of the live food markets just outside of Hong Kong. Um, and people thought it was these cats, and we'll see why that was in just a second. But um, the consensus right now is almost definitely that it came from bats. And we'll see where that came from as well. And again, this is the whole concept of, of the reservoir. Now, if you have this huge outbreak of human disease out of nowhere, um, viruses don't come out of nowhere. Um, and so that's where these things are most of the time. Um, one of the things that I like to look at here um, is if you go to Medline Arena, PubMed, Medline, looking for references and what people are writing on. Um, so there are uh, a little over 4,000 SARS coronavirus Medline citations. Um, so that's about one publication per two cases, which is, <laughs> we could argue about how <clears throat> reasonable that is. But to give you a bit of an idea, you now when people were first looking at these, again, before SARS, 129. Um, up to 2002 publications on coronaviruses, 620 in just 2003 again, and then since 2004 there have been zero cases. So started first reported cases in early 2013, uh, sorry, 2013, 2003, 2004, gone. Um, despite that fact, um, it was just uh, mentioned as a select agent. How many of you know what a select agent is? Not 007. <laughs> uh, but these are particular reagents that if you're working with in a lab need to be reported. They need to be reported to CDC, they need to be reported specifically to NIH, and you need particular guidelines in terms of actually working with these. So um, they're, most of the SARS right now, as far as we know, are all in various different um, research labs, although we'll talk about, again, towards the end, some of the ways that you can get a hold of a coronavirus um, without then getting these whole viruses. So let's talk a little bit more about reservoir species. Just a couple of references if you're interested in looking at some of where I got this data from. I'm not going to go into those in too much more detail, but if you look at some of these studies, you see that over 50% of bats in the Philippines, and this is a large number of bats, uh, just looking for this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the genes anyway, not clear if they actually have virus there, it's a different story. Um, none of these bats seem to have symptoms, but over 50% you can actually detect these genes, very specific coronavirus RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Uh, bats in the US also have lots of coronaviruses, but so far no directly SARS-related coronaviruses. And I wanted to mention this phylogeny here, um, people clear on phylogenies, seen phylogenies like this before? You could describe exactly on an essay exam what they mean. 
And what all of these things? Good, okay, but a few of you haven't raised your hand. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about this. So basically what these represent are comparing sequences to each other, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you compare a whole bunch of sequences to each other, and in this case, uh, if I remember correctly, these are, this is also that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase gene sequence. And you line all these sequences up relative to each other, and then look at the differences that you have between these sequences. Then you plug all of these sequences into a number of different computer programs, and I forget which one this one was used, um, which will then tell you how similar these sequences are to each other um, relative to all of the other ones. And then what this happens is this iterates many, many, many different times. And so then you have a whole collection of these putative <clears throat> trees, which is, you know, you assume this was a common ancestor to all of these other viruses, and then those have diverged in terms of their sequence. But a lot of this, again, depends on that sequence alignment and making assumptions about how things have evolved. Yeah, Trevor. This is sort of an alternate approach to what you mentioned weeks ago about structural continuity, right? Because... <clears throat> yeah, so um, this kind of phylogeny is based on sequence similarity. The problem with the really deep phylogeny, really ancient viruses and how those are related to each other, you can't make those sequence alignments. You can't take a sequence and then line it up with something else and say, oh, this is where it is. So this is your, what's alive right now. These are much more closely related so you can see sequence similarity. If you can't see sequence similarity, you can't make these trees. So that's very important. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so if you look at these sequences, and then the more similar they are to each other, each of these sequences, the shorter each of these lines are. So for instance, uh, let's take a, take a look at uh, this bat coronavirus versus these bat coronaviruses. Um, the length of these lines represents the amount of sequence difference. The other thing that's really important when you're looking at these kinds of trees is looking at these numbers. This one here, for instance, 23, 100, etc. So what do these represent? How many iterations that, that result? Yeah, so how many iterations out of 100, in this case, that result in that particular branch? So here, 100%, that's pretty darn good. 23? That's crap. Um, and basically, any time that you've got a number under about 70, um, it's really not completely clear that, for instance, this set of viruses is most closely related to this set. Whereas at 100%, yeah, that's pretty reasonable that these are related to each other. And you know, 90%, these two are right next to each other. And this is why people thought that SARS originally came from the civet cat, because they were able to isolate a virus from the cats in these live food markets, sequence those genes, and saw that they were extremely similar to the human ones. Now, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that the cats had those viruses before. And in fact, they went out into the environment outside of the food markets, and they found that practically none of these civet cats had these particular <clears throat> sequences in them. And there's much more bat sequences that are not only really similar to SARS, but also have this vast amount of diversity. All of these other sequences that are actually listed here, the beginning, bat, 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 bat. So there's a huge amount of diversity in the bat viruses relative to um, SARS, or even for that matter, we've got a, there's a turkey coronavirus hidden in here somewhere, and there it is, the turkey coronavirus, um, which is clearly related to this sequence, but eh, maybe, may or may not be related to all of these sequences. So this is the way that people are now looking at trying to get an idea where some of these reservoir species are and when you may or may not start to get some kind of spillover. Yeah? So is that iterations of the modern modeling software being processed? Or? So it's iterations of making these kinds of phylogenies. So running a simulation. So it's literally running that mathematical simulation multiple times. And it's usually called something like, they call bootstrapping. So going back and redoing that. Yeah? How do they theorize that spread? 
how do they theorize that the coronavirus has been spread from bat to humans? Um, to be perfectly honest, they really don't know. Um, and but quite possibly there was some kind of intermediate host. So it may well be that the bats infected the cats, and that was the cats that then ended up infecting the humans. Bats are far too easy to sample, yes, although I wouldn't want to do that, given all the viruses that people find in them. Yeah. First, first David, then, yeah, you go. Uh, why did it collapse? Was this isolation and a quarantine, or is it like <laughs> So why, why are, haven't there been any cases of yeah. SARS since 2004? Was it like an unstable year that just doesn't work? Yeah, yeah. That's like an that. extremely good question. We don't know. Okay. Um, and um, when we... If we get to MERS at the end, <laughs> um, ooh, it's the, their, MERS is coming back again and again and again. And so why SARS hasn't is really anybody's guess. Probably these kinds of spillover events are very, very rare. And it may well be that you need this intermediate host to get that to happen. Yeah, David. Yeah, was the, you, there may be no way to know this, but was the SARS hysteria driven by the media listening to virologists or <laughs> well, if they listen to us all the time, of course, it would be no problem whatsoever. Um, no, the, um, <clears throat> yeah, you have to sell newspapers or advertising or uh, whatever that happens to be. And um, the mortality of SARS was about 10%, so um, pretty high levels of mortality. So I think that was why um, the media sort of jumped onto this. Um, but in retrospect, it probably was a really good thing that this happened because surveillance, and we were talking about that right before class, has gone way up um, based on this because uh, part of the reason that there was such a, I think, a really large jump um, between the single first case and 1,000 literally a month later was that it had probably been suppressed, um, some of that reporting beforehand. And reporting has gotten much, much, much better since then. So literally in the last decade, reporting has gotten infinitely better, I would say. So yeah, there's a balance. I'm not going to say you know, all journalists are bad. Um, <laughs> social media too. Now, social media is another Probably issue as well. So um, another quick clicker question, because we like them so much and I need a drink. Um, <laughs> highest diversity in stars like coronaviruses is known in bats, beluga whale, ferrets, humans, or mice. Oh, no, the spillover book I haven't read, but yeah, I know of it. Do you know um, Planet of Viruses? Um, David Zimmer wrote a nice little book on Planet of Viruses, which I think is really good. Yeah, and just you know, a couple of chapters basically sort of you know, different things, but really much more about environmental virology and not so much about disease virology. David Zimmer, plan, uh, a plan, I think it's either a planet of viruses or planet of viruses. Pardon? Carl Zimmer, Carl Zimmer, not Zimmer. Yep, uh, that's that's the one. I think. <laughs> There's that one person who's really trying to mess up my statistics. Probably it's a unregistered clicker that you know, somebody brought along. Um, which does remind me, there are one or two of you that have um, an unregistered clicker, so make sure that you have your clicker scores that are being appropriately registered um, here. But yes, of course, it's the bats. Um, why did I put up the beluga whale? Anybody have any idea there? Because they're cute. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and delicious. Uh, it turns out that the largest coronavirus in terms of genome size ever found is from a beluga whale. Oh. So people started looking at lots of these things. Um, ferrets, we'll talk about lots of ferrets later on. Um, they're great mm -hmm. models for looking at influenza-like disease and how influenza gets transmitted. Um, the human SARS, actually, the genome sequences are almost identical to each other. All the new um, genomes that people have looked at there and then 
Um, mice, uh, as far as we know, don't have any SARS-like coronaviruses associated with them. So <clears throat> that's enough for SARS. You know, who cares about all this disease stuff? You now it's just ridiculous. Um, but <clears throat> talk a little bit more about the cool molecular aspects of these viruses, um, particularly starting out with the TM. And again, I mentioned this before. Uh, it's really mostly about the crown. That's why they're called a coronavirus, um, which is all these spikes. Um, and this is your envelope glycoprotein. Again, very typical in terms of thinking about these particular envelope viruses. They've got this thing that sticks through the membrane and has lots of sugar residues um, on the outside. Envelope. Um, one thing that's a little different um, with these enveloped viruses so far is these also have very clearly helical nucleocapsids. And so the nucleocapsid is the genome plus protein. And very, very rarely are you going to have a virus that doesn't have its genome complex with protein when it's inside the virion. And so um, if you get rid of this envelope, you'll find a really nice helically symmetric uh, nucleocapsid protein with all of the RNA um, associated with the, the capsid protein. Few of the coronaviruses have icosahedral nucleocapsids, but for the most part, and the interesting ones like SARS, um, have these helico, helical nucleocapsids. So that's cartoon shown here. Here's your helical nucleocapsid packed inside your envelope. Of course, very rarely do these things um, pretty spherical. They've got lots of different shapes um, like we had back here. Um, this is much more typical in terms of looking at a lot of these coronaviruses. Uh, the spike protein <clears throat> um, on the outside, which just gives it this corona shape, um, is a trimeric protein. We'll see this again and again and again. Um, that was true for, when we looked at entry, certainly for dengue, when you finally have the entry form, that's a trimeric protein. For influenza, it's a trimeric protein. Uh, that's very involved in fusion, and the fusion seems to happen very similarly to what we've seen for influenza virus, conformational change of the different pH, um, etc. There's also, in some cases, a um, what they call the HE, pro HE protein, and this is mostly to refer to <clears throat> the influenza viruses we'll get back to later on. Um, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase um, binds to red blood cells and gets them to clump together. So you can use hemagglutination, in fact, to study these particular viruses. Um, more important, at least as far as this concerns, is what's called the M protein. We haven't really talked too much about M proteins yet. Um, I know that Alec talked about them a little bit last time. These are membrane proteins um, that are really important for holding all the spikes together um, here and really serving as a bridge between these spike proteins and the nucleocapsid proteins. So we'll see M proteins a lot, particularly move through a lot more of the viruses here. This M protein is membrane, but also very often people will call it a matrix protein. We'll talk about that when we talk about HIV as well. Um, really serving as an adapter between the receptor proteins on the outside and the nucleocapsid proteins on the inside. And then there's a small envelope protein, again, E, we'll see very often, E for envelope, um, may or may not be involved in budding. We're not completely sure about that. What do these guys bind to? I mentioned before, these are all many cases, at least for the different coronaviruses. We mentioned a whole bunch of different classes. Uh, but the main thing here is that they're interacting with peptidases or proteases. And these make a lot of sense in terms of, again, breaking down the capsid structure in order to be able to release the genome inside the cell. So if you interact with a protease, that protease is going to cleave whatever your receptor binding protein is or some of the other proteins, and that seems to help with the fusion process, um, is that particular. There are other ones as well, and in some cases um, may even be sialic acid, which is what um, all the influenza viruses bind to. How does fusion take place? Um, either endoplasmic reticulum or at the plasma membrane. So the actual change in structure, so for influenza, for all the flaviviruses, what usually causes that change in structure? Change in pH. Um, you're not seeing this kind of change in pH in terms of coronaviruses. So it's going to be at plasma membrane where there's no particular change in the pH, where sometimes once it gets in, there'll be some fusion at the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, the fusion proteins are 
basically same kind of thing as HIV, <clears throat> excuse me, influenza, these long extended proteins that are sticking up from the viral membrane that have fusion peptides at the end that'll stick into the host membrane and then cause fusion to take place. <clears throat> so what comes in? This is the genome. Again, these are the largest positive strand, single strand RNA virus genomes, and that beluga whale virus is the 31,686 uh, in terms of That's huge for an RNA virus genome. If you think about most of the RNA viruses we've talked about so far, they've been you know, 3,000. In the case of the flaviviruses, up to about 10,000. These are three times as big as that. They're absolutely enormous. And a lot of people thought this was not possible, that you could have these huge RNA virus genomes because RNA-dependent RNA polymerases don't have proofreading activity. And so they put in a lot of changes when they're replicating. And the, a lot of predictions were made that you can't get beyond about 10,000 and still have a genome which is going to be replicated with high enough fidelity to keep it going through. And well, we'll see how some of these <clears throat> coronaviruses get away with this. Um, turns out that their RNA dependent RNA polymerase may actually even have a little bit of proofreading activity. Yeah? I was wondering, is the beluga where just an extreme outlier of an example, or is it just the biggest? And so the beluga whale is just the biggest. Um, a lot of these are about 30,000. If I remember correctly, SARS is about 28,000. So um, they're big. They're really big genomes. Um, in those genomes, um, it is a <clears throat> monomolecular positive strand RNA. Uh, and it has basically these you know, six or seven genes, again, depends on your coronavirus. Uh, this is gene one, and then we've got all these genes two through seven. Um, genes two through seven, as we'll see a little bit later, are made by these subgenomic RNAs. But if you just look at what comes inside the cell, it's got a five prime cap. It's got a poly A tail. In most cases, um, that poly A tail is encoded for in the genome. So replicating a lot like the picoRNA viruses. You've got these poly A tails. We'll see later there are viruses that have poly A tails that are added in different ways. Um, and a five prime cap structure. This five prime cap structure, uh, is made by viral proteins because this is not replicating in the nucleus. It's replicating um, outside of the nucleus. Uh, these polyproteins are huge, not surprisingly. If you've got a 30,000 base pair genome, uh, these polyproteins are going to be really, really big. And what happens when you've got polyproteins? They get chopped up with various different proteases. Um, did want to mention here, uh, most of these proteins here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, etc. Um, these are all going to be your non-structural proteins. So these are all of your enzymatic proteins. And then all the structural proteins are down here. These should look very familiar. Your spike protein, your envelope protein, your membrane protein, um, your nucleocapsid protein, your hemagglutin and esterase protein, um, which are all over here at the end. Um, there's a whole huge list of these different proteins. Um, Again, I've circled them. I'm not going to expect you to remember all these names. What the heck is NS5 for coronaviruses? I can't remember. I can't expect you to remember. More important is what their activities are. And we've really kind of talked about these already. Um, proteinase domains, um, important for cleaving non-structural proteins. Here's another protease. So two different viral proteases. This one's a lot like the picoRNA virus 3C protease. RNA dependent, RNA polymerases, RNA modifying enzymes, O-methyl transferases. What do you need O-methyl transferases for? So making five prime caps, exactly. And then we talked about a bunch of these structural proteins here. So you need proteases, you need RNA dependent, RNA polymerases. And then this one is interesting too. It's an RNA helicase which you probably need for separating positive and negative strands um, in terms of replication processes. And as I mentioned before, um, this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is probably involved in making a little bit of, of proofreading take place. <clears throat> so how do you make these non-structural proteins? Um, also made through translation. Um, one really big open reading frame but the second set of proteins here are encoded out of frame in this same one gene. So what happens? 
sense. Um, right here, between the 11 and 12 gene, you have a pseudonaut structure, and pseudonauts are just secondary structures that form an RNA from 5 prime to 3 prime. And unfortunately, this is the two-dimensional structure here. These really line up as nice helical structures. So this end here lines up on top of the helix right here, and they're incredibly stable secondary structures. So these pseudonauts, the fact that you have this RNA coming inside the cell, when translation hits this pseudonaut, it bounces back a nucleotide and then will continue to make this polyprotein. So the first polyprotein is here, this ORF1A, and in some cases, not all of them, the ribosome will keep translating all the way through the rest of this. In other cases, it's actually going to stop right here. And it turns out these are the proteins that you need less of, these are the proteins that you need more of. So this is how you get all of your non-structural proteins. How the heck we get all these structural proteins is something we'll get to in a couple of slides. Um, but these non-structural proteins, what do non-structural proteins do? They're important for RNA replication, making more of the genome. How does it happen? It happens at cytoplasmic vesicles, which should sound really, really familiar. Where else do you see cytoplasmic vesicles replication taking place? Flaviviruses and picoRNA viruses. And also, to some extent, um, some of the plant viruses like cauliflower mosaic virus. So very common that you have these cytoplasmic vesicles. How do you get those cytoplasmic vesicles? Um, there's this question mark here about autophagy. Um, potentially, the viruses, and this is you know, highly controversial, will stimulate basically cells eating themselves and making a whole bunch of extra internal vesicles, which then allows the virus to replicate. Now, how that works is still a very open question. Um, people have looked at how much of negative strand versus positive strand you get. Um, turns out there's a lot less of the negative strand than the positive strand. Exactly how that's regulated, nobody really has a good idea. Um, and that's a very active area of research. I'm trying to look at that. Um, the other thing which happens very frequently when you're looking at replication of these genomes is huge amounts of recombination. And so what happens is you'll have half of a genome from one virus, another half of a genome from another virus, and these then get hooked up to each other. So it seems that the polymerases are not highly perceptive. They bounce onto RNA and come off of RNA. And this may well be how these viruses can have such long genomes. And basically the recombination that happens during replication is a lot like meiotic recombination that you have in a lot of eukaryotic cells. You're deleting the deleterious mutations through this recombination process. So it's kind of like a sexual reproduction. So you've got multiple copies of the genome. And so you may have made a whole bunch of mistakes in one genome. You make a whole bunch of mistakes in another genome. But because they're recombining with each other, you can actually end up with something which is viable. Yeah? Well, does that have to be um, a component in why these are pathogenic in the way that they are, and that there's this burst of like lethality, and then they kind of disappear? So uh, the question here is, you know, is this a potential explanation for lethality? Um, people have, have thought about that as being a potential reason for why this is happening, and this recombination is you know, causing the jump from one host range to another. Uh, it's hard, so well, how, you, how you try and do that is you sequence a whole bunch of genomes and then look at them and see if you have any indi indication for this recombination taking place. Um, so far there's been no real obvious things for that. The bat coronaviruses that are the most closely related to SARS for instance um, don't seem to be that different in such a way as you could really easily um, come up with these recombination events as an explanation for that. So, but it's a, uh, a really interesting question of things that people are very interested in looking at exactly what's going on there with these different diseases. Okay, so <clears throat> the big surprise came along when people were looking at these coronaviruses, and we knew this before um, people knew about SARS, is that there are a whole bunch of small RNAs in infected cells that just corresponded to all of the structural protein genes. And it turns out you had way more of these RNAs than you had of these full-length genomic RNAs. So that was the first indication that there were these short RNAs 
um, that were important for making all the structural proteins. And to some extent, it makes sense. And we don't know, we haven't talked how that happens. But you need a whole bunch more of these proteins. You need a whole bunch more of your structural proteins than you do of the non-structural proteins. And we talked about this already for you know, RNA viruses and many other viruses as well. Much more of your structural proteins than your non-structural proteins. The way that the coronaviruses have solved this particular problem is to make all of these subgenomic RNAs. So that you know, kind of made sense, but the question is, how does that happen? Then the next thing came along, which is it turns out that these subgenomic RNAs all have identical sequences at the 5' prime end, right next to the cap, and that's the same sequence as is present in the full-length genomic RNA, all the way over here. And so one of the questions that came up very soon after doing the sequencing was how does this happen? You know, was it um, the RNA polymerase, and it's still that same RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that makes these, um, jumping from template to template, or is there something that happens to this header structure that then gets ligated to all of these different RNAs? And this is the theory. There's a lot of evidence for this. It's not going to be completely shown yet. But the idea here is you have your full-length genomic RNA, again, up to 30,000 bases in length. Now you have your RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which will start out at the 3' prime end, extend here until it gets to one of these repeated sequences. And these are what are called the TRS sequences. The sequence here is not important, but they're repeated sequences. And it seems that every time one of these RNA polymerases gets to one of these TRS sequences, it can jump over and then replicate here at the very 5' prime end. So this is absolutely required for getting functional viruses because you need a whole bunch of these subgenomic RNAs. And to get those subgenomic RNAs, Cohen's not talking to me nicely today, uh, get these subgenomic RNAs, if you just have a particular frequency, say, 10% of the time you jump over here, 10% of the time next time you jump over here, etc. You're going to end up with all of these subgenomic copies now of the 3' prime end of your genome. These then can be replicated by, again, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and give you all of these subgenomic messenger RNAs. And the vast majority of these are going to be encoding these proteins here right at the end. It turns out this is the end of the nucleocapsid protein, which is the protein that you need the most of. So this recombination, which is happening here, each time the RNA polymerase gets to one of these sequences, it can jump. It could also jump to a different template, which is going to give you the recombination that you might need to deal with all of these extra mutations that are arising here. So the polymerase jumps. And that jumping of the polymerase um, gives you these subgenomic RNAs and is probably also important for dealing with deleterious mutations. This is kind of a funky process. Um, but this was called the nested subgenomic RNA because you've got all of these RNAs over here which are smaller than your genomic RNA but overlap all with each other um, here at the 3' prime end. Make sense? No? Huh? Friday, we're almost done. <laughs> yeah, Trevor. Um, so when you, this is makes sense for when you're transcribing, translating those, you know, the necessary uh, proteins. But what if, what, how does that differ for when you need to go ahead and do the rest of the genome? Like, oh, so I guess the question here is um, how much of the full length genome versus any of these subgenomic RNAs? Um, so it seems that it's basically just a numbers game. You end up with a lot fewer copies of this full-length negative strand. As I mentioned, 1 to 2%. Um, and then once you have this full-length strand, the polymerase going in this opposite direction doesn't jump anymore. It's only when it's making a negative strand is it going to jump. So it does just seem to be a numbers game as far as we know. Okay, once you've made all these proteins, then you put them together. Assembly here happens, again, in an internal membrane structure. It should sound really, really familiar now, kind of the broken record approach. Um, you've got the spike proteins and the 
<clears throat> matrix, nucleocapsid, bind to your genomes. This buds into the Golgi and then transfers through the Golgi process. There's proteolysis that takes place here, just like that happens with the flaviviruses. And then these secretory vesicles will fuse with the plasma membrane and release these already enveloped viruses, which are present inside the cell. And so here, you bud basically into the Golgi. That will then give you a secretory vesicle when you fuse with the outer membrane. That then releases these virus particles, which can go off and infect other cells. So that's all the whole replication process for coronaviruses. I spend the last five minutes or so talking about um, some of the cool other stuff you can do with these coronaviruses. As I mentioned before, um, the SARS virus you only find in labs, but people have also worked out ways to make the um, coronavirus in the absence of actually having the whole stock of the virus in your lab. How does that work? Um, this is what's called a reverse genetics experiment. Um, basically what you do is you have their genomic RNA and you know what the genome is of that. You then take little pieces of this genome, make them into complementary DNA. I use reverse transcriptase and have complementary DNA. Lots of different segments of complementary DNA. Um, and then in this particular case, you're interested in the activity of one particular gene and you think that making a mutation here is going to change that function in some way. All of these DNA pieces, um, usually they'll be in a friendly plasmid that's got nice restriction in the nucleus sites at either end. You can ligate all of these DNA segments together. You have one big piece of DNA, about 30,000 nucleotides in length, with our friend a T7 DNA polymerase promoter. Why? Because then you can put in the T7, actually T7 RNA polymerase, I should say, T7 RNA polymerase promoter. That will make your full-length RNA genome. And it's true with all of these positive strand RNA viruses. This is now infectious. You put it into mouse cells, use an electroprator like the one we had, mutant viruses from hell. Um, and that positive strand RNA genome gets translated into all the proteins that you need to make a coronavirus in the first place. Yeah? Does step three have a real high challenge to get something with usable fidelity? Um, so the step three with putting together all these cDNA fragments, um, as long as you've designed this properly, it's actually pretty easy to do this. You'll have different restriction endonucleases at either end here. Um, so this works actually quite well um, to put all of these things together. The key here is getting all of these cDNAs. We're actually, in fact, ordering a bunch of the cDNAs at some point. Um, this is where all the companies that make oligonucleotides, their machines start to flash big red lights when it turns out to be matching coronaviruses or SARS or anything like that. So <clears throat> that's it for the coronaviruses. We'll have one more click, quick clicker question, just because they're so much fun. Um, oh, come on, start. Um, like flaviviruses, coronaviruses assemble as panamers, the plasma membrane, nuclear membrane, F, internal membranes. D, E disappeared, so nobody better vote E. Except for that person who's trying to ruin my statistics. <laughs> At beluga whales. <laughs> e, beluga whales. <laughs> there we go. That's gotta that's gotta be my like extra one. Whenever I can be is a beluga whale. <laughs> that's a great answer. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. If in doubt. Yeah. Uh, well, we can talk about that in office hours afterwards. That's a great question. Okay, what do we have? Yes, um, it is D. No one likes E, which is good. Um, 
did, before everyone runs away, and I know it's Friday, um, I just want to scare you appropriately. And so um, that, I think, is we can do here. Um, quickly through, <clears throat> um, SARS is gone, but MERS is still here. Um, this is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, coronaviruses, um, 30 to 40% fatality rate. Anybody heard about MERS? Yes, um, a lot more people heard about SARS, but why that is not clear. Um, they also found um, a coronavirus associated with this. Um, Korea, literally last year, one case was imported. It had 186 cases, 36 of them fatal. Um, and then it was gone um, by July 4th. So these outbreaks can be really, really rapid. And this um, was a really good surveillance, public health approach, quarantine, etc. But um, it took them a while to figure this out because who thought about Korea? Korea wasn't supposed to be a place that you had um, these coronaviruses. Uh, MERS in the USA, two cases. They were both recovered in nine days, 750 tested negative. Um, there's this connection to CNN where they go, oh, deadly virus, ah, 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 ah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Where's the reservoir species? Almost definitely in camels. Um, there's been a lot of work um, done on that literally in the last couple of years. But unlike SARS, MERS is still around. And these are all of the infections um, since 2012 when they originally detected it. Um, 2013, big outbreak in 2014. This is the Korean outbreak in 2015. And um, here's another outbreak now. This looks a lot more like what we'll see with influenza um, a little bit later on. How does it get around? Airplanes. Um, mostly in Saudi Arabia. The vast majority of cases are in Saudi Arabia. But they've been spread to a number of different places. This is out of date. It doesn't have the, the Korean um, example on here as well. Seems to be a seasonal dependency. Quite what that seasonal dependency is is not clear. Um, and then there's this survivor raft, which is hilarious. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this. Um, but, yeah, SARS is a virus <laughs> I just want to minus. <laughs> so with that, um, it's the virus I just want to minus. It worked. It's gone. Oh, this link, by the way, does not work. Um, but there are other links you can find it. Oh, not